Welcome everybody to the next episode of Chiefs Focus First and Ten Live. You're here with JP and Quentin. What's up, my man? Hey, um, you know, kind of a quieter day, but yeah. you need those every once in a while. Yeah, we had a few coaching moves. We did, and um, still the rumor miracle rumor mill continues to run. It definitely does. You hear things and then you wonder how true it is and then you call somebody else to find out if what you heard the first time was true. Um, let's start it off with the Chargers really quick. <laughs> I'm blown out of the water that they released Joe Lombardi and uh, Day when... It's pretty obvious the head coach is the issue. Now, I understand they got to a playoff game, but Staley's the one calling those plays on the field for the most part, and he can overturn them at any point. That was in his contract, especially during the playoffs. He has the final say from what I'm told. I don't understand why they did that. I, the only concept or conceivable notion or whatever you want to call it, would be the fact that they want somebody like Staley that doesn't really care about player health and safety. And they made a move for the yes man. And I don't believe for one second that um, Lombardi is a yes man. So, we'll, you know, in the coming days we'll find out if they decide to move on from Staley Right now, it doesn't look like they're going to, but we'll have to see. What's your thoughts on that? Um, I think that, you know, the I think there's a reason why that they did it, and I think that the offense this year for the Chargers never really took full advantage of his talents, of Herbert's talents, and I think a lot of that is just the two different styles of offense that, you know, what should have been run and what was being run. Lombardi is more of a short pass, run the ball kind of offense, and that's not the kind of offense that you need to be running with with Herbert. And we know that the, the run game for the Chargers was bad to begin with. So when your offense is built around running the ball and passing the ball um, in short passing game, and you literally can't do one of those things, I, I think that's the justification behind getting rid of him. Um, the quarterback coach, that's interesting to me, but the because I, I don't that to me is more of like what's going on behind the scenes type deal because yeah. it's hard to, to say you know what what does the quarterback coach have to say on a game basis but the offensive coordinator I understand because it just it just didn't seem to fit the kind of offense that he wants to run and the talent that you have with Herbert how long I, I don't know how long he's been with them but it hasn't been a huge amount of time I want to say maybe two years, but I could be wrong. Um, this was a problem with Derek. Carr. It's his second season. Yeah. So, uh, what's up? This. This has been the problem with Derek Carr, other than the fact that he is a baby. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, but he's had eight different coaches in a nine, ten year span. You know, when you add them all up. You can't stay consistent if you don't have, if you're listening to different people's philosophies and different people's schemes, and you know, you got a year or two with one guy, and then all of a sudden somebody comes in and says, everything you just learned, throw it out the window, you gotta start over. Herbert has done very well since the day he was tossed into that game with us. He just hasn't had the right, I don't think, Staley is a good coach, a good players coach. 
and I've heard this from other people, but he just doesn't really care much about his players. You know, it's like if they can play, if they can, or I should say, if they can walk and breathe, they should be on the field. And that's a really quick way of ending someone's career early, a really good way of doing that, and also not getting where you want to be. Bosa went out of that game injured again. Um, Mike Williams has had a back injury for a long time, probably knew what it was, and then he had, you know, came out that he had a fracture in his back. So, I don't know. I think as long as that ownership group is in place, they're never going to do very well because they haven't. And it kind of goes to show you when you're swapping head coaches every two or three years or you're swapping offensive coordinators or any kind of coordinator for that matter, you're never going to have consistency. Well, know. you want to hear some of the numbers mm-hmm. on just how poor the – Chargers offense was this year. Yeah. So now his passing touchdowns went from 38 to 25 this year. So that right there is already a dip, a significant dip in the offense. But I was talking about the rushing defense earlier, and they averaged 89.6 yards per game. That's 30th in the NFL. That's 3.8 yards per rush, which is 30th. Even in the in the red zone. They converted 54% of their touchdowns. Uh, red zone drives were in, into touchdowns. So that's 17th. So you're below average there. Um, their goal-to-go percentage for touchdowns was 65% of the time, which was 23rd in the NFL. So not only are you struggling in the way that you expect your offense to be run, which, like I said, they were a not a run-first team, but they were a team that heavily depended on a run, which is... They're just not balanced. the way that they're not the way that their team is built. They were going three and out on twenty one percent of their drives, which was eighteenth in the NFL. So you just start start to see that a lot of this stuff you shouldn't expect that sort of performance when you know that you have one of the better quarterbacks in the league. Okay, but let me ask you this. Is that not on the head coach and the GM for not bringing in depth and relying on two wide receivers that were injured pretty much the the entire season? Uh, yeah, I think there's a real conversation you can have there. Um, and the fact that, you know, Justin Herbert, you know, hurt his ribs in week two, I think it's fair to have those to have those conversations. Keenan Allen and Mike Williams only played four games together. Um, but I think after a, after a game like that, what happened with the Jaguars, you know, heads got to roll. So someone's going to get fired and i think that this is a move that doesn't surprise me and if something was going to happen i think that this was a move that you really had to make because let's if we're being honest with ourselves the chargers offense underperformed this year they did but i mean again you have no depth and you have two wide receivers or aging wide receivers that are your best you know on the field and they're they both were injured pretty much the entire season as you said they didn't play but four games together and now we can also look at the defense and say, okay, well, we brought in Khalil Mack and we have Joey Bosa, yet Joey Bosa has been injured. So why didn't the defense have any, the defensive coordinator have any, um, and this still may happen, I don't know, but why wasn't he fired because he allowed 31 unanswered points? I, I mean, it goes both directions. So you could say, yeah, it was all on Joe Lombardi or anybody could, I guess, for that matter. But in reality, it was on both sides of the ball. And if it's on both sides of the ball, it's usually a head coaching issue. Usually. You want to know what's crazy is that Mike Williams and Keenan Allen are the third and fourth highest paid players on that roster, respectively. Yeah. Yeah. They Keenan, Keenan Allen, Allen gets – Fat contract. Keenan Allen gets paid – his base salary is $15.5 million a year, and Mike Williams is twelve. Keenan Allen's 30 years old and Mike Williams is a little younger at 28, but yeah. that's crazy that that's just the way that your your roster is built. And they've got a well, couple years left on the Mike Williams contract. When's Keenan uh, Allen's like, up? Keenan Allen, let's see. Hold on. Is it 2025? Uh, he goes into the 2024 season, so he's got two, two years left on his deal. Yeah. 
I mean, and so, when he's 32 years old, he'll have an $18 million base. He'll have a $25 million cap hit in, thir- when, in 2024. Well, I guarantee you won't see that, but um, I, I, I don't know. I, I just see it, and I look at it, and I think, wow. They really just went one-sided with this, and I think it might have been Staley playing his cards um, and using, I mean, Lombardi as a pawn, but whatever. I mean, it is what it is. They're, I, I don't think they're ever going to be successful with that ownership group. And honestly, I mean, when you're paying your two best wide receivers half of what some of the top wide receivers make in the market and then are in the league, and then they're below market value on top of that, I can almost understand why, because you really don't have a fan base. So if you're not selling out and selling merchandise and doing the things that you need to do that every other football team is doing, even the Lions do better than them as far as a fan base and, you know, selling merchandise and filling the stadium, they, you know, they don't have to pay anybody big money if they don't want to. Because, they're you know, they can always put it back on the players. Well, you guys aren't playing well enough to fill the stadium. You know, when we got 7,000 people showing up to a, to a game and 4,500 of them are Rams and Raiders fans because they're bored and the tickets are so cheap, what's up, Scott? Um, you know, it, 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 it plays a part in it as well. You know, you're sharing a stadium. You're doing so many different things. It's very difficult in L.A. and Oakland to be a, a, a franchise anyway because they keep up in the ante on everything. The taxes are extremely high. It's just difficult, but when you add all these things together, they I think they need to be sold. If if they need fresh blood in there, a new organization, new front office to help them build. That's just my opinion. After all these years, I mean, since 2004, they have really kind of faltered. They get so far, then they fall off. They get so far, and they fall off, and they always blamed it on Rivers, which a lot of it could have been Rivers. Um, but you can't continue to blame it on every quarterback you have. Well, and, and here's the crazy you know. thing is that Justin Herbert's getting ready to be paid. I mean, yeah. roll up the Banks truck because he's he's in his – this will be – he's coming up on his final year. So this yeah. offseason, we know how these work. These quarterbacks or any of these top guys that get drafted, if you're a superstar or a quality player on the team – a year before your contract ends, you're signing that new deal because it allows your team to get a little bit of flexibility on your contracts and it gives you some guaranteed money. So Justin Herbert uh, is going to get the bag this offseason and it's only going to make it more difficult to build a roster around him. It just depends on if they give it to him or not, I guess. I mean, uh, he's got a year basically – Really, he doesn't. I mean, the, the Chargers won't. It's going to end up being another Raven situation. The difference is, is that Herbert has an agent. And you're going to end up in a situation where your quarterback is not going to want to stay if they're not going to keep him in the loop of things and then also keep him loaded with some type of talent. Uh, what's up, Corey? Um, I, I just I see this happening um, – I, I see this not going down very well for Staley or the organization when it comes to Herbert. Because to be honest with you, if you take the top elite quarterbacks in the league or what the above average quarterbacks in the league right now, I would put him probably top three, four, if he had the right system. The kid is talented. He just doesn't have the roster around him and he doesn't have the coaching. And I, I think it starts with the head coach. So I don't know. Uh, the kid played with a broken cartilage in his rib. I still and, can't you know, believe that. Here's the thing. Look, all the head coaches I've ever been around, starting with Marty, the one thing that they always said was, is that our job is to protect the players. You know, that's first and foremost. Then you win. If you can't protect your players from themselves, then what good are you? And, that's the one thing that Staley does not do is protect his players from themselves. Of course, every competitive player is going to go out there and say, man, I can play. I can handle it. I can do this. This is not going to be a problem. But You have to reality, find the balance. Be. You have to. You have to find the balance. I mean, Toradol is not the answer for everything. 
And I don't know. I, I just don't. I don't see how they can continue on this path and be successful in any way. And for everybody out there, all these talking heads that keep saying, "Oh, this is the Chargers' year." I mean, this is the now the eleventh year <laughs> we've heard this is the Chargers' year. Uh, if it's you could win Lombardi trophies, if you could win Lombardi trophies in the off season, the Chargers would be the most successful franchise in NFL history, possibly no, sports fail. history. Yeah. But here's the problem with Justin Herbert. Here's his problem, the dilemma that he's put in. Let's say he doesn't sign an, uh, a new deal in the off season that keeps him there for another four years, right? He lets his rookie contract expire at the end of this year, right? Well, he was a first round draft pick, which means the team has the fifth year option, and then. If he still doesn't want to go, if he still doesn't sign anything with them, they can franchise tag him. Yeah. And then if he still doesn't want to be there, they can franchise tag him again. So they can keep him there for another three years. And what will end up happening is he's just going to miss out on a lot of guaranteed money. He's going to miss out on a lot of cash because whatever they're going to sign him for, for an extended contract, is going to be worth more than their franchise tag either time, even – despite the fact that the franchise tag goes up 20% on the second franchise tag. Well, not He's, to mention the fact also they got to go off market value of, of your top, what, five quarterbacks? It's in the the top five. Yeah. It's the top five at your position. It gets kind of funky when you get to like defensive <clears throat> tackles and ends, because technically it's calculated as just defensive linemen. So it actually kind of drops the number a little bit. It's the same with offensive linemen. It's not broken up by groups. It's like, if you get franchise tagged as a guard, it's the same if you're franchise tagged as a as a tackle. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's my point: is the average of the top five quarterbacks in the league are well over thirty million a year. So, how much are they going to be paying him to franchise tag him? I mean, you got Dak Prescott making forty, Mahomes making forty-one, uh, even Kirk Cousins has got a decent contract uh, now since he resigned. Uh, Garoppolo, look at the contract he got. And he's not even a top five quarterback. So how are they going to work them numbers? I guess that's my question. Is it worth maybe giving him a two or three year extension and seeing if it sticks with him? Or is it worth putting the franchise tag on him and paying him $25 million a year the first year and maybe 30 the next? Um, you know, it, it's just to me, it's very strange. I, I don't know how they're – I don't know who they have running their front office or, or, or what the situation is, but it's not run well. So – I just leads. say if you're the Chargers, you got to stick with Herbert. you got to keep – got to stick with Herbert because when you when you finally get your guy, you know, you got to do what you can to keep him there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he, he's obviously a quality player who could win that team uh, a lot – he can he can lead that team to a lot of wins and he playoff can lead wins. Super Bowl um, if they had the right coaching, he really can. I think yeah. Justin Herbert's a, a top quarterback in the NFL, and uh, I just think that his opportunities to continue to win are going to be limited because, unfortunately for him, he's playing in the same division as Patrick Mahomes, which means every every year he's probably going to have to win three away games in the playoffs because he very rarely is going to win the division if ever just because of just because of who else yeah. is in the division so yeah. but because yeah. he got drafted by the Chargers he's sort of stuck there because it's better he's better off signing a 5 year contract extension with a huge signing bonus than trying to worry about trying to play the year to year contract game like Darrell Revis used to do yeah, I guess his whole mindset would be, and I, if I was him, I guess I should say, my mindset would be, I am not going to waste my career with a team that's not going to help me. And I think that's where he's going to have to make the decision and make it early. He's a very humble kid, and I like him. I mean, I think he's a good player, and I think he's a good person. I don't see him as a an arrogant or a, you know, give me every dollar right now type of guy. But I do see him wanting what he's close to being what he's worth and a team that shows him the respect to bring him in the players that he deserves i guess that's what i see from him but uh moving on from that aaron Rodgers made a statement today on oh the aaron Rodgers drama yeah he made a statement on the pat mcafee show today which i understand why um 
the question was posed about a rebuild. And he absolutely said he would not play. He said, if a rebuild is in place, I am not going to be a part of it. So if they plan on rebuilding at any point in this offseason, he is not going to be a part of it. He said, if they feel like Justin, or uh, what's his name, Justin, what's his name, Love? J, J, no. Something Love, whatever his name is. Yeah. I mean, he's played in so long, I forgot. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking Jalen Hurts. But Jordan. Jordan. Jordan Love. Yeah, I knew it started with a J. Yeah. Uh, they, he said, hey, if he's ready and they're they're willing to make that move, then that's great for them. He said, then it's my decision on whether I want to play for another football team or if I you know, continue on and playing for another team or if I want to hang it up. Yeah. I don't think he's really ready. I don't know. It's, it's hard to tell with Rodgers because there's times that he looks so um, not even defeated but bored. It's like that you just – when you get up and you know you got to go to work and you really hate your job type of situation – I think it's more or less he hates his atmosphere. He hates what he has to deal with when he goes in there. I don't think he hates playing football. So he's got to make a decision on what um, what he wants to do. I had said before that I didn't think he was going back to the to Green Bay this year. So or this coming year. So I, I still don't think he is. If they decide to make a have a complete meltdown rebuild, he's done. And I can't blame him. I yeah, mean, I was going to ask you, just what are your thoughts on his comments? I I can't blame the guy. I mean, look, it, is Aaron a little bit <laughs> pretentious? Yes. Is he a little arrogant? Yes. He seems a little eccentric to a degree, but he's not stupid. And he got played. He got played by that GM and president. It's that simple. He got a fat contract to come in and they took everything away from him and left him with a bag of rocks. And when you do something like that to a guy that's already loaded and can go anywhere he wants to go, even if he sat out for a year and enjoyed himself on the golf course, drinking scotch and having a good old time, it's not going to affect his bank account in any aspect. He can go anywhere else and get a good contract. So they made the mistake, in my opinion, and I think they're going to pay for it in the long run. He is the better of the quarterbacks that they have. Love has not proven himself at any point when he has played. I don't think he is ready to take on and then them make a, an immediate leap anywhere with him. So I think it's good. there's going to be another year of drama with Aaron and... I have a strange feeling he's going to end up with another team if they allow him to move on or he's going to retire for a year and walk away from that team that way. If it's the only way he can get out, if they do a rebuild, he's definitely not going to be a part of it. And he actually said that he wasn't going to be a part of any rebuild team. He wants to go to a team that has legitimate players that have talent. Now, he did make mention that if you know he goes to a team that has talent on the roster but may not be as seasoned that's a different story but you know his last statement about it was you know you've only got two options if they do a rebuild I won't be any part of it then I either find another team or I retire so that was basically how he worded it Um, I can't blame him for that I just can't it's been too much turmoil over the last five years with, with that team in general and when you have somebody that good it, it's pretty hard and he knows he's good. Um, he really isn't asking for every dollar that he can actually get. He just wants a team. He wants to go to another Super Bowl. And he flat out said, I can win another MVP with the right team, with the right you know group. But he doesn't see it happening with what he's got right now. So, I don't know. Uh, it's going to be interesting in the next few months to see what happens with Aaron. What are your thoughts on his comments? I think it's I think it's totally fair. Uh, I think if another quarterback came out and said, or another player came out and said it, you know, I think he would get a lot of backlash. I don't know if he got a lot of backlash, but I assume some people had a problem with it. But I understand it, right? You're at a point in your career where you know you know that the time left on the field um, is is a lot less than the time you have spent on the field. You know your career is coming at an end within the next year or two. 
possibly this is it. So why would you, why would you say that um, I'm okay with the team trying to rebuild? You know, yeah, yeah. it just I you know you got to appreciate the honesty when it comes out. I do think that he comes back because why would he have signed a you know a two year contract if he didn't want to come back for the two years? Um, Fifty million dollars is a lot to leave on the table. And I know he has, you know, he's already made a ton of money in his career, but to come back for another year, plus you saw the team start to play better at the end of the year. Who's to say that you can't pick off where you left off right there? Um, I think that the Packers defense, I thought, I thought personally was going to be much better than what it was. I thought that every level of the defense sort of played below my expectations and I'm not even a Packers fan. So I could only imagine what, the uh, what Packers uh, fans thought about this defense going in because I thought that that team uh, underperformed on that side of the ball and then we know it you know that offense got off to a very slow start at the beginning of the year and then they went on that run when Aaron Rodgers and his wide receivers started to you know started to get together so I think that this I I think they're going to be a better team next year and uh, if Aaron Rodgers is there so It'll be interesting. I can't imagine that they, long story short, I can't imagine that they look to quote unquote rebuild when they were on the edge of, you know, winning, winning a game to make it to the playoffs. Well, I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that Rodgers was, you know, he finally did gel, like you said, with his wide receivers and the line started to actually protect him. But maybe if you showed up to your off season, uh, off season stuff, just because it's not mandatory in the contract doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it or should do well, it. That, you know, that's, uh, I mean, and that's fair too. I mean, it. it you're the it, quarterback. You get paid fifty million dollars a year. You're the quarterback of one of the most historic franchises in the NFL. Show up to freaking off-season programming so you and your wide receivers, who are rookies or newer guys to this system, can get to know you and know your traits instead of trying to figure this stuff out in the middle of the season. I think it was irresponsible on Aaron Rodgers' part to do that, but that's just I agree, case. and I actually agree with you on that. The one thing I will say is is that last year, with all the turmoil that was going on and the inner, you know, the, the, the just the inner turmoil itself between him between him and the front office, it was difficult for him to not see that happen. You know, to not just sit out and go, wait a minute, if you guys are gonna, you know do this then I don't know what to tell you you know I I understand from both sides of it I think it was irresponsible of him but in the same aspect if he would have went back he would have caved and caving is not the answer when it comes to certain situations you just don't want to cave you want to hold your ground and stand your ground and that's the one thing I can say about him is he does stand his ground you know he he wants to enjoy his life he's 38 years old He's going to be 39, and I think he's smart enough to understand that time, like you said, time is of the essence right now. He's only got a few really good years left in him before he starts looking like Brady did last night. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's just – and look, I mean, for all intents and purposes, they they brought in one wide receiver for him, and it was Sammy Watkins that ended up on the IR. So, I thought Sammy Watkins was just always on the IR. Yeah, that's pretty much his second home. Yeah, I mean, I think he's got a condo somewhere that says IR above it. Yeah, we we know uh, we know that there's Chiefs fans out here robbing banks, but the real robber is Sammy <laughs> Watkins because he's just taken a taken football money while sitting on the IR for these past what six years. Fuck, if not longer. I mean, he started off with Buffalo, basically injured. And he was injured, what, three of the years he was with us. And then he went to the, who was it, the Ravens? Yeah, then, he moved to the Ravens and then to the Packers back, and then back to the back Ravens. To the Ravens. So, I mean, and then, of course, he caused a interception in that last game of theirs, but he pulled a Tyreek. But uh, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know what else to say other than the fact that at least the guy is honest about it. He's not pulling any punches he doesn't allow i think what i like about him is is that he doesn't go as far as to be a complete 
dickhead, but yet he he says what he means. You know, you can. <laughs> I mean, you could be other players that in the past that have just come out and said whatever they wanted to say regardless of who it pissed off. But he he, he knows the line. You know, there's a fine line between being a complete jerk-off and then saying what you mean without being a jerk-off. And he does a pretty good job of that, I think. But we'll just have to see how it plays out. I think it's just going to be another year unless they come to him right now and say, look, we're not going to change anything. We're going to bring in a couple wide receivers that are good. We're going to bolster up the offensive line and get you a running back that's decent, and we're going to try and help with the defense. You know, I mean, that's really all they can do to keep him around because if they go to, if they rebuild and launch everybody and then start fresh, say if it, whether it be coaches or players or both, he's not going to stay there. And I couldn't blame him. Yeah, I, you know, it's not like that division's getting much better. Um, I think that the Vikings overperformed. I think that if you know if you're looking at taking any futures bets, is that the Vikings will be a nine and eight team next year, just because there's no you can't win eleven one game one score games in a row and continue that into next season. I think that the Lions will probably be right around where they are this year, you know, right around a five hundred team, and the Bears aren't turning it around in one no. year. I the know Bears are the only team that I would give any promise to, out other than if Green Bay straightens out. Yeah. But- They'd be the only team I give any promise to. I'm. Uh, I like Justin Fields. I think he's an exciting player to watch, and yeah. um, I think that you know the Bears just need to keep trading uh, out of that that number one pick. You know they trade to like eight or nine, and then they trade out of number nine until they just get acquire just an ass load of of picks, and then they can go from there. But well, like we've always said, strength of schedule is fucking real, and it's real. I mean. You can say somebody has the number one defense all day long. Look who they're playing before you say that. Look at the offenses you go up against. You can also say that about offenses. Look at the defenses they go up against. I mean, we watched it happen for years with Brady. And when he goes up against a team and it's really shown, well, a couple of things have shown. One is that he doesn't get the love from the refs that he used to get. All those refs are finally gone. I mean, they got fat pay, uh, bank accounts, but they're gone. And now you got these refs that aren't going to coddle him. If you feel like you're 45 and you can come out here and handle it, then fucking handle it. If you can't, I don't know what to tell you, but this is, you know. And last night there was one call that I would say was really a bad call, was the, non, the, the non-call of holding in the end zone. That was the only call I would say that was bad. They did a really good job of letting the players play not being really ignorant about calling stupid penalties. Um, I wish wish the NFL could ref like this the whole year. This, um, what, I don't know. What do they call it? The, the like, in like quick replays that they do, they have a, Mm -hmm. they have a word for it or like, but the, the, they're not forcing coaches to use challenges when, you know, they think it's a completed pass or an incomplete pass. They have that quick expedited, expedited Expedited. reviews. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that has worked awesome. I don't know why this isn't something that's used throughout the entire NFL. It helps speeds the game up. It, I like it when the ref explains to me why they made that decision. I think that was something that the XFL did really well is when there was a play that was challenged, they would go up. They had a camera in the box where the sky judge was sitting and he was just explaining why he was thinking the way he was thinking. And I think that if umpires did this, we we may not agree with the decision that may make, but at least you understand the reasoning behind it. And I think whether it's uh, whether the call goes for or against your team, I think you could make it 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 is easier to swallow if you understand why they made the decision, because most people are reasonable people. Well, and the fact that they don't understand every rule, like there was a couple of like a, a, a play last night that there was they, they expected a call, but they didn't because Brady was outside of the box. Yeah. So if you explain it the way they should um, and the way they did last night, I think it goes a lot further. The one thing I will say is that that's how it's supposed to be. And I know it irritates everybody to hear that, but I've talked to people in New York. I talk to people all the time out there and it's supposed to be that way. They have people that watch these these games. We've they, seen the setup. We've seen it. So it's not like it's it's unheard of. It It's like they dwindled it down right around the COVID, and then they never brought it back again. 
and they need to bring that back because look no matter how you want to ice this cake it's going to screw a lot of people out of playoff wins or getting into the playoffs or whatever the case may be the playoffs right now this is the most i've seen that the refs are actually relying on new york to make a decision and new york is actually attentive enough to make a decision or to call that you know that expedited review so that's something that I think they need to continue and they need to really work on that because bringing in all these new referee crews is great. I'm glad they are because they're getting rid of all the old scumbags that fucked around and just lined their pockets. So now it's time to just move on and do what you have to do and do it the right way. Maybe they're going to finally. Maybe they you know they 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 see the the comments, the ratings will drop a little bit. I'm sure it has to some degree. Um and, you know, when people, when you've got tens of thousands of people saying, I'm sick and tired of watching the WWE or watching a fixed boxing game, that's when you got to make some changes or a boxing match. So you got to make some changes at that point because all it's going to do is just keep, continue to piss people off. Yeah. And then they're going to get to a point where they don't want to watch it anymore. Especially when the NFL is getting in bed with a bunch of gambling, uh, yeah. gambling places. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I think that, you know, sports gambling can be really fun uh you know i can't do it but you know because i live in missouri that's going but away pretty soon i so. i hope so um but i like talking about you know some of the the parlays that people put together or some of the things that some of the niche things that people talk about i do enjoy the conversations because i think they spur up different kinds of conversations than what you normally would have because you start talking about you know what is this individual player going to produce and I've been told by people I know who do bet on sports that it makes the game more exciting because if you're betting on a game that you have no other interest in except it's a Thursday night game you know, with the Commanders and the Bears, well, let me put a little money on Justin Fields to get you know, a 665 rushing yards. And yeah. you know, whenever he takes that, whenever he breaks that big runoff, it's going to make that even more exciting because you know, maybe I'm going to make some money off of it. So... I think the NFL, that expedited review process has worked fantastic this playoffs. I'd like to see that continue into next year's regular season. And I'd like to see them try to continue to improve, you know, this during the off season, the process that, that they're doing it. And, you know, there was an ESPN article that came out two weeks ago, I think, um, about the Rams Seahawks game and that the, there were, inside of the article they were saying that the owners and there were some office front office people that were kind of pissed about how poorly officiated that game is and when you finally have owners you know saying off the record that they're upset with how officiating has gone this year i think that's how you get change because in the end these are 32 different individual businesses that when you have these are the the head honchos you have to get 24 of them to vote on making changes. And if you can get that to, if you can get those changes made, you piss off enough owners, things will change. Yeah, I agree. And that's, I think that's what it's coming down to. But the last thing you want to do is turn this into boxing because we all know that boxing has went downhill because of being fixed. And it's, it's not a good idea. You, this you know boxing was the highest rated sport at one time you know everybody watched it hell i watched every one of mike tyson's fights probably 25 times and i will watch them if there's a frenzy of it on or if it's like a binge deal and tyson's fights i will sit down and watch it no matter what i'm doing but you can't turn it into what it was what boxing was because if you do in five years you're going to be in the same position that they are now where, you know, people are going to, uh, you know, MMA, they're watching it. They, fuck people will watch WWE before they'll watch a, a, a boxing match. And that's sad. You don't want it to turn to that really quick. Let's, uh, we got to take a break for our sponsors and we'll be right back. This show is brought to you by FOCO Sports. With over 11,000 licensed items to choose from, and some of the most unique handmade products, 
you can find all the sports gear you could ask for. Unique bobbleheads, clothing, accessories and much more. From every team, in your favorite sport, they have it all. Check out all of their gear at the link below, or, on our pinned tweet on our Twitter account. As well as, all our social media platforms. At Chiefs Focus on Twitter, or, our official website, www.chiefsfocus.com. Okay, we're back. Um, make sure you guys check that out because they have some unique stuff coming out. And I want to say this really quick because everybody, they don't understand what a blackout is. And I will explain this to you really quick. So when FOCO decides to come up with an on-the-spot design for a bobblehead, they will put out a blackout for a pre-order. What you need to do is go on to the website through our channels and you will see all the things that they have sold out of that are bobbleheads that they've come up with that were blackouts that they came up with on the spot on you know right when the play happened right now they have the ring around the rosy bobblehead that's coming out and it's going to be very unique nobody else is going to be able to even match what they're coming up with so and then we also have another item coming out that every Chiefs fan that is a real Chiefs fan is going to want a bobblehead that's coming out and it's going to be exclusive to Chiefs Focus so make sure you check it out and as I said on any of our platforms on our website it's all there anyway getting back to this uh, phenomenal show that we're going through here yeah you want to let's just talk about some of the head coaching jobs that are open and I Definitely. think the first the first thing that sort of surprised me is that it's all but confirmed that Jim Harbaugh and actually it is confirmed Jim Harbaugh is returning to Michigan yes um, the athletic director came out and, and gave a whole spiel about that, and that kind of surprises me. Um, I really thought that he was going to end up as a head coach in the NFL again. It sounds like that some of the rhetoric he said sounds like he wants to be back in the NFL when your brother has won a Super Bowl, beat you at a Super Bowl, and, you know, it just sounds like that's what you're going to – every time you go to Christmas, Thanksgiving, he's going to have that ring on. And that's gonna sting. Um, <laughs> your three million. I'm serious though. Yeah. When when your buyout is three million dollars, you know that's nothing to an NFL organization. And you have a level one NCAA violation coming after you. It just all seemed to me that it would have been a great time to get out of Michigan. But he's going back, and that's one less guy that people are going to be able to turn to 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 fill their head coaching vacancy. I agree. Um, I wasn't surprised. He had said, I don't know, probably three or four weeks ago that he had no plans of leaving. And everybody thought it was just him, you know, trying to keep Michigan happy. Um, I didn't. I thought, you know, he's always been a straight shooter. He doesn't doesn't play games. And I thought he was going to stay. He feels... To me, it seems like he feels somewhat obligated to that team and those players. Also, he's done very well there, and he gets paid very well. So he knows that a team that's going to take him right now is a team in turmoil. And how long is it going to take him to get that team back to where it needs to be and bring in the right players and do all the things that need to be done when he's comfortable where he's at? I mean, yeah, this, the, it would be great to have a Super Bowl ring, but... I don't know, sometimes you have to be a little more practical about it, and I think that's what he's doing, for the time being anyway. Um, I'm kind of happy he went back. Not for any other reason than the fact that I think the kids deserve to have a great coach, and that's what he's got, you know, that's what they have with him. So, uh, with that being said, um, there's been some coaching changes that, and some openings, a lot of interviews, as we've seen, um, our guy Aaron Wilson has been putting them all over the place, all over Twitter. So what uh, what do you think about some of these coaching stains? See, wait a minute. This said, I think he likes the college life over the uh, over the, over coaching. For, I, I actually agree with you. I think he does too. They're a lot easier to coach. They're not as demanding where NFL players are very demanding. And there's a lot of drama that goes along with it. So I actually agree with you on that one, Thiz. I think he probably does like it. It's a little easier and you get paid a lot more. So you get to groom people from day one instead of 
coming into a group of guys that where you you've got a mix of rookies and then a mix of uh, vets that and some of those vets are, can make it hard, you know, for a new coach, regardless of who they are. So if you're comfortable, take it, you know. But uh, what do you think of these coaching interviews and who do you think is going to go where? Um. Well, just some of the vacancies uh, at the moment. So the Panthers, Cardinals, the Colts, Broncos, and Texans, I believe, are all of the head coaching vacancies available right now. Um, a couple of them have interviewed. Um, I'm pretty sure that the Broncos have asked for, if you are a U.S. citizen, have asked you to interview for the head coaching job. Yeah. Um, and Same I don't with. I think you have to have a high school diploma. I think it's just yeah. a GED, but I'm not sure. Uh, same with the the Panthers. The Panthers have also requested a whole bunch of guys to to do the coaching uh, to to interview for the head coaching job. Uh, one of the interesting ones that I saw for the Panthers was the Patriots linebackers coach. I don't know why people keep going back to the interviewing Patriots coordinators or coaches to be their head coach. Haven't we seen this enough? Like it doesn't work yeah, out. Like it, it, why? Why? We've been seeing this for twenty years. Different coaches have left New England and have, and have tried to go and be head coaches somewhere else, and it just doesn't seem to work. The only one that has worked is the Titans head coach, and he was a player at one point. So that, to me, that one doesn't even count. No, it doesn't. I, honestly, I, just, I mean, when you really look at it, Belichick's a great coach, but he doesn't have a coaching tree. He's got a limb, and the limb is very thin, but he doesn't have a tree. He's got a switch. So I, I don't know why they keep going back. I mean, Josh McDaniels is a great example of why it doesn't work. So is Matt Patricia. and Joe Judge. Joe Judge. I mean, I don't know what I, – I guess people think that they can bring the Patriot way to their organization and make it work, but the only person that's going to ever make that work is Belichick. It's that simple. So – I mean, look at the turmoil that McDaniels is in right now, trying to make the Patriot way in the Raiders. He's got a quarterback that's gone. And I don't know if I mentioned this on the last show, but uh, Derek Carr did a stood up and did a, basically a speech at his church about um, his situation with the Raiders and <clears throat> what he's doing right now. And he said right now all he's doing is actually sitting at home and enjoying his family. And... He says he has no ill will towards anyone. I have a hard time believing that, but I would have ill will if I was benched two, you know, two games prior to the playoffs and then not getting in. But uh, he says he's going to take some time off and spend it with his family. I, I don't know if Josh McDaniels is the best answer to anybody's head coaching position. So what do you think? I mean, I think that I mean there are two guys that have worked out from the Bill Belichick tree. Um, I think that Brian Flores is a great coach, and I think unironically that Bill O'Brien was a good head coach. His problem was that he wanted to be the GM as well, and that's where that fell apart. Yeah. But you even got like Romeo Cornell is a Patriots guy, and we all remember how that went here in Kansas City. He's a fine defensive coordinator, but you know, trying well, remember, to come here. He was a he was a head coach too. Yeah, he was a head coach in, in Cleveland, and yeah. uh, and you know he took over here in Kansas City, yeah. and then went to the it went to Houston and was their head coach for a little bit. So, yeah. I mean, just I, I just don't understand that that philosophy, that thought process. Um, I want to. I, I think uh, Brian Flores. I think it sounds like he's going to end up in uh, Arizona. The GM that they hired is also a. Patriots guy and you know there's that they work together for a while I still think I think Brian Flores is a great spot to go in Arizona uh, same of my reasons why I think Eric Bieniemy would be great in Arizona I think that I think that whole organization just needs a swift kick in the ass yeah. it's just it needs a different sort of personality and we see this in the NFL that when you fire one coach you, the next coach you hire is the complete opposite and Brian Flores is a very, you know, this is football. This is how we do it. We're going to, you're going to come in here. We're going to do this, 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 and this. And that's how it's going to be run. 
and we know Cliff Kingsbury was a very relaxed guy, and you can tell that just from his press conferences. And mm-hmm. so I think that Brian Flores going to Arizona is going to be, if it does happen, a great fit. Well, I agree with you, and I, I think Kingsbury will definitely have a job in the NFL somewhere, as you know, as, in some in some fashion. But I think now that that GM has stepped away, and I can right now I can't remember his name. I can't stand the guy, but um, since he has stepped away from Arizona for health reasons, um, <laughs> well, we know that's not really the case. But uh, I think. They will turn it around. I think they get, they get the right GM in there. And whether it be a head coach GM combo, you know, one person doing the same thing, um, which that's a Sean Payton style. You know, really, a, if you think about it, the coaches that are, that are really wanting a job right now, he'd be the only one that would be able to do both um, with his experience. But I don't think, I don't know that he'll go there. Um, I did hear that he likes Kyler Murray, and if he is good, you know, it's a, it's an option for him. But so are the Broncos and the Texans. <laughs> I mean, the Panthers. There's a lot of options. The one thing I will say about him is that he does not like rookie quarterbacks, and he doesn't like quarterbacks that struggle. So unless he can bring in his own group of guys, a great quarterbacks coach that can help him, I don't know that he will go to. Arizona at all, Sean Payton. Yeah, I don't think he's going to go to Denver. From what I understand, he doesn't even like Russell Wilson, and he doesn't want that that diva mentality. So I don't know. I mean, unless they offer him something stupid, and they completely change Russell Wilson's contract to where he can't have his own, you know, catering company in there and his own office with his own masseuse and his own this and his own that and recording studios or whatever else he wants in there so his wife can sing a song to him while he's getting an ice bath. I don't know. Um, all I know is, is that uh, Wilson is probably not going to get the head coach that he wants. Here, here's, what I'll, here's what I'll say about, the, about Sean Payton. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but Sean Payton, when he became the coach, of the head coach of the Saints, he actually tried to get Tony Romo as his quarterback. Yeah, he did in New Orleans. Yeah. And so when he took that job over, he didn't know what his quarterback situation was going to be. And he got he ended up with Drew Brees because the Dolphins backed out um, when they figured out. I think it's just because of the extent of the injury. And so Drew Brees or um, Sean Payton took a chance on Drew Brees, and you know the rest is history. With how crazy this quarterback carousel is going to be, I think that no matter where he goes, as long as he has say in who's going to bring in, I don't know if that's necessarily going to be an issue because Jimmy Garoppolo is going to be a free agent. We Derek Carr is basically a free agent at this point because I still yeah. believe that he's going to get cut. And then there's just a bunch of other guys from Gardner Minshew, uh, Taylor Heineke. I, there's a bunch of other just average tier guys too that are going to be free agents so as long as there's quarterback uh, he gets to say what quarterback he brings in i have no problem thinking that he's going to be able to have say in that so if that's his holdback is you know him wanting an older quarterback a veteran quarterback there's plenty of guys out there and i totally think that sean payton can work with a jimmy garoppolo or a Derek carr in order to have a successful offense run under a guy like that because those guys aren't horrible. They're not bad. They're just no. average quarterbacks, and somebody has to be an average quarterback. Yeah, yeah. You're not going to have. You're not always going to have three or four top tier quarterbacks in the league at you know any given moment. But I will say that Garoppolo. I have a weird feeling he's going to go back to New England. If he is, if he gets traded, he will go back to New England. I think he wants to go back there. He didn't want to leave when he was booted out of there. That was a Brady craft thing. Yeah. And I think he would go back. So if he ends up back with the Patriots, which they definitely need a quarterback, um, I wouldn't be surprised at all. As far as Peyton is concerned, I think yeah, I agree with you. He does, It's not necessarily that he wants a veteran. He just wants somebody that has got an extremely high football IQ. He was somebody that not, he doesn't have to train or to teach because he's not the greatest with quarterbacks. 
And I've yet to find out that he's hired a quarterback coach that actually has say in anything. The entire time he was with the Saints, I don't think he had a quarterback coach. In fact, Drew Brees was his quarterback coach as well as the quarterback. So I don't know that even if he had one there, again, he didn't have a lot of say. So he needs to realize that if you want – if you want to put a good team together to come in and help you, because no better, there's no better manager in the world than one that can delegate out to the right people. The so, art of delegation. Yep. So if he wants to do that, that's great. You know, that's something he needs to do. But again, it's up to him. I heard the other day that Jeff Fisher is still trying to get a job in the NFL. Doesn't I thought he worked in like the XFL. Uh, he does, and he wants in the NFL again. Oh, okay. Guy told me that he has been, he is still calling teams trying to get a job in the NFL. Strangely enough, he was offered a couple of positions that weren't head coach and he turned it down because he thought it was moving backwards. Well, I will say this you can't go backwards from something you don't have right now and you haven't had since 2016. So it's either a time to, if you want to be in the NFL, take that, that, that leap and be whatever they want you to be or you stick with where you're at weird that he's still trying to get that i mean he was self-promoting himself on or self-promoting on uh i think it was espn at one point when he was working for them saying that he was ready for a head coaching job anybody that was i mean he was like ready to put his phone number out on to the world to call him for a job so i don't know but he's just a weird guy um very strange individual but you got, uh, I agree with you, you got a lot of coaches that are on the move. Probably going to be a few more at this point. I don't see this ending. I don't think it's over yet. I think there's probably going to be a, not just head coaches, but other coaches that are going to be moved around. We can talk about the EB situation because it sounds like he's got a few interviews set up for after the 23rd. And I have a feeling he is going to get a job this year, whether it be offensive coordinator somewhere else, which I know that, uh, the Texans actually requested for him and Nagy. Titans. Or Titans, I'm sorry. And I don't think Nagy would even consider it, but the enemy might. It would so. be weird if um, Nagy ended up taking that. Now, I don't know if – because technically the Chiefs can block the Nagy yeah. interview. They can. So – I would figure that there's a conversation going on right now with him, and the conversation is essentially, do you think he'd want that job? And if Nagy says yes, they'll let it happen. If they say no, they'll just block it. Yeah. I, so if it comes out that the Kansas City Chiefs blocked Matt Nagy from having the offensive coordinator interview for the Tennessee Titans, I assume to me that it's going to say that Matt Nagy isn't even thinking about going and doing that. Yeah, and, I, and he can actually turn it down himself. He doesn't have I, to be blocked. He can just say, you know what, I don't want to take the interview. Oh, I know that, but that's just sort of the – that's that's my thought. But just based on the way the Chiefs organization is run, I just think that's the way that that's going to, to end up. I think it's pretty it's pretty shitty that, you know, now the thought process behind Eric Bieniemy is in order for him to get a head coaching job, he has to go somewhere else outside of the Andy Reid wing yeah. and prove that he can do it because – you know, the excuses continue to be made about Eric Bieniemy, And at first it was like, oh, he's not a play caller. He's not calling the plays, so he can't go be a head coach somewhere else. And then it was, and you know, then it turned into, well, he's just not a good interviewer. And well, he's not. That well, I, I, it's, just, fact, but yeah. it's just all these things just keep coming up. And I think he just, he needs to take a shot. And I can't believe that he hasn't gotten one to this point. And I know we've talked about this both on air and we've talked about some stuff, you know, that we don't want to disclose, but yeah. it's just crazy that he hasn't gotten a single chance yet. I think he's had some opportunities from what I understand. He has just kind of talked himself out of those opportunities. And when you have somebody that says, you know, we want to bring you in, but yet you talk yourself out of that situation because of whether you want, you know, you say you want this, you want that, you want the other, or you just talk too much. Sometimes that happens, and I can actually see it. I mean, like I said, I've, I've talked to people that have been in interviews with him, and it didn't go well. I, I don't – I mean, look, 
people can say what they want. That with the enemy, it's definitely not a race thing. I mean, it's just not. You don't go through 23 interviews, two, let's see, is it two or three colleges? I think it's two colleges. And nobody hire you if it's because of race. It just doesn't happen. So he has to change up his style of interview and what he is going to do, especially a guy that's never been a head coach in this league. You can't go in there gung-ho talking like you are the best when you haven't proven you're the best. And again, one interview, I was told flat out that they said they didn't believe it was him. They thought it was Andy and Pat, and if it, unless it was a, patch, a, a, a package deal, they didn't want him. So, and they flat out told him they didn't think it was him. So I don't know. We'll just have to see how it goes. I think he will get a job this year. I think it'll be somewhere else, whether it be a head coach or an offensive coordinator. I think he's going to get a job. I just don't know where that will be. It might be the OC for the Texans to get you know out of there. If he proves himself there, then maybe he can get a head coaching job. But it's very difficult to get a head coaching position when – you're under an Andy Reid, Patrick Mahomes umbrella. Because look what Mahomes has done this year with not only some turmoil, but a whole new group of guys, with the exception of uh, Kelsey and then McCall Hardman that's been injured for a while, and we can get into that in a minute. But um, he's done things that nobody else could do with what he's been given this year. Now, I'm not saying he's got a bunch of scrubs. That's not what I'm saying at all. But when you're trying to gel with, you know, three or four or five new guys, that's not an easy thing to do unless you're really good. And to, to lose three games this year by three points each, I think he did his job. And I think he's proven himself that, you know what, I can make anybody good. So it's, it's difficult when you're under that umbrella and you come out of it, unless somebody's extremely desperate – and you are a squeaky clean individual. There's no NFL rumors going around. There's no um, inner circle rumors. There's no background issues, and you don't have interview uh, issues. You're going to get a job, but it's just hard coming out of this organization. And, and I would push back on that. And what I would say to that is, you know, I think that with how well the Chiefs' offense did this year, is even more of a reason why an NFL organization should want him. Because we see that, you know, you've done, you've been here for the whole Patrick Mahomes era, and with finally some of the questions have come have been answered as to you know how good is Patrick Mahomes. You sort of say, well, is it just, you know, is it because of the Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey? And then you take away, you know, Tyreek Hill, and you still see that it's in some cases better than what the offense was and so because you're the offensive coordinator of that system you know even if you think even if you think that Andy Reid is worth 90 percent of the work being done there you've got to think that that 10 percent that is Eric Bieniemy can benefit your organization and with teams that are as desperate as the Houston Texans or the Denver Broncos or the Carolina Panthers you know some of these teams that either haven't made the playoffs in a long time or haven't won a playoff game in a long time, you figure that the, the opportunity to just get a little bit of that success in your in your organization room would be beneficial to bring in uh, a guy like Eric Bieniemy. And then in terms of, like, a, you know, a background issues, an NFL organization traded for Deshaun Watson and gave him a fully a guaranteed contract. So organizations are willing to push some of that stuff aside. Yeah, I think there's a huge difference. And I, I agree with you in a lot of the, what you said. I think there's a huge difference between a Deshaun Watson that prior to all these issues was really probably the second best quarterback in the league and then just behind Mahomes. And then you have a coach that has not proven himself in certain ways to, and then all the rumors that go around and the things that have happened and players saying certain things that used to play here, it just puts a bad taste in people's mouths. Now, 
there are some desperate teams out there this year, and I think this is the year that he does get an opportunity somewhere. He almost has to. For his own sake and for the sake of the Chiefs, he really needs – I think it's just time for a fresh start. And you also have to look at it from this aspect. What's going on, Chiefs Live? Um, you have to look at it from this aspect. If Eric Bieniemy were to walk onto a field – as a head coach, could he make up a playbook? And I'm not saying using Andy's plays, make up his own playbook and base it off of maybe some, a little of Andy, a little of Belichick, a little of some guy from the 40s, some guy from the 60s, some college team, whatever the mix may be, and be successful behind it. And that's what I think a lot of times they look at, is that is he going to be successful in building an offense a team and a crew to work with him, a group of coaches. And I think sometimes that's what they look at. Now, again, you got teams like the Broncos that brought in a three and six high school football coach because of who his dad was. There, that's happened numerous times. The Colts you know? hired a dude sitting on ESPN's. I don't even know what show Jeff Saturday was on. But I can guarantee you Eric Bieniemy will be a better head coach than Saturday. Can't confirm. Probably, I, I, I can guarantee you that. And just, just because you're the head coach, you know, look at what Brian Dayball did. You know, he brought in somebody else to call the plays. So Eric Bieniemy doesn't have to be the head coach to come in, the offensive guy, and call plays. You know, he can find somebody else to do that, too. It's not unheard of. No, I'm, I, and I, I agree. I'm just saying – when it comes down to putting plays together, you need to bring somebody in that's really smart, that knows how to put, like Nagy knows how to draw up some crazy plays. And I think that's something that you have to look at. And I know that goes through the interview process of what kind of plays can you put together? Do you have a playbook? Do you have a portfolio of plays that you've drawn up over the last five years that are your own, that aren't Andy's, that aren't Nagy's, that aren't somebody else's? And if you can't prove that, and show that that's something you have, that's going to be a little difficult. Now, Bro, just, just download, a different just download the Madden plays. Just do that. <laughs> just go, go, go on Madden. And you know what? You can even mix it up. You can go on like 2008 Madden and then, you know, 2019 and just pick them all off there. Hey, and I agree. I mean, look, I, with the Saturday thing, to me it was weird. Um, it was stupid. We can it be was, honest about it. It really was. It was just dumb. I don't know if it was just the fact that he didn't have anybody else to go to. I know they're buddies. They're really close friends, and that could have been a big part of it. But and he knew the season was kind of tanked anyway, so why not bring somebody in that you know is a buddy and see what he can do? You never know what you you get unless you try. And it's not like Saturday was asking for you know eight ten million a year. You know he he wasn't, and he brought in people and he relied on other people to do what little bit that they did do. But, again, I don't know. I think Eric Bieniemy gets a job this year. I just don't know where it's going to be. And it's going to be a little while before we find out because, again, we got the playoffs in front of us. And right now, you know, he can't even interview right now. So No, I think you can interview – I think you can do in-person interviews on Friday. Yeah, I think it was the 23rd is what I heard, but I could be wrong. But uh, yeah, that next Monday? Next Monday, yeah. So – I think, you know, and look, if there's coaches out there that are on the street or that aren't in the playoffs right now, they can interview. So if somebody takes a job, somebody takes a job. You know, that's another thing that you have to look at. If a team's not willing to wait because, you you know, every day you spend waiting is a day that you don't have a roster together and you don't have a coaching staff together, they may not be willing to wait. Who knows? I just hope that he does get a job and – Things just progress from there. Um, Nagy's in line for the OC job and already assistant, basically assistant head coach anyway. So it just kind of – and everybody just really gravitates towards Nagy. I mean, they, they like his style of coaching. They like the plays he draws up. Um, it just – it's almost like you have a cog in the wheel that – has got one missing tooth, and that one missing tooth can cause some controversy. I can't say Eric Benjamin's all bad. I don't know the man. All I can say is is that 
everything that I've heard from the people that I talk to and what I've seen, I, I think it's just time for a fresh start. I think that he would make a good coach in Arizona. Like I said last week, I still stand by that. Uh, the Colts job is interesting. Uh, it would depend on, on, you know, who you bring in. There is that Chris Ballard was here in Kansas city for a while. So yeah. there is that sort of tie into, so, uh, the Colts job, I mean, it's not the worst job available, you know, the Broncos still exist. So it well, would be interesting. It's going to be, um, it's going to be definitely, a a, a very interesting off season, but we got to get into something really quick. So we got to talk about these games. I mean, we haven't talked about that at all. So we watched a game last night that I honestly I kind of expected. I I actually I think I said it on the show before that I didn't I the only way the Cowboys would lose is if Dak fell off the the wagon uh, when it comes to his playoff performances. Um, if he took a dip like he has in the past, but he didn't last night. He played his best game of his career last night. I I have no doubt in that. Um, Brady, I don't know if we've seen the Cowboys offense play like that all year. They haven't. It and, was – I mean, it was a great <clears throat> performance. They were running the ball well. They were, they were using Zeke and Tony Pollard effectively. I don't yeah. think that they overused one. They kept both of them fresh. That defense, I mean – you know, when you have a 45-year quarterback that refuses to take a hit and ducks and covers like the turtle from the Cold War, <laughs> you just have you just have no no chance to you know, be able to set up some of those deeper throws because that pass rush is so effective. I think that honestly, this is probably the best outcome because I don't know if the 49ers whipped the Cowboys. Um, I can guarantee you the 49ers would have whipped the Buccaneers though. Oh, so yeah. I think this is the best outcome in terms of, you know, like the games. And it's funny, you know, in the AFC, we have before this era, I would say the Bengals, Bills and Chiefs haven't been very good. And so you're in this new age in the AFC with these new young quarterbacks. And then the NFC, it's like you're taking a time machine back to the 90s where you've got Cowboys, 49ers and Giants, Eagles, you know, yeah. it's it's kind of weird how how this has worked out, but I well, can't believe how poorly the Buccaneers played last night. Defense they, look, defense was bad. I'm, you know what played really good? The PAT team on the 49ers because they just kept all of them from being scored. Probably because yeah. they didn't do anything. But well, I will say this. I said I put a tweet out yesterday about Bucker, and I said I don't ever want to hear a bad thing about Bucker. <laughs> <laughs> um, and people are still arguing about that, but uh, a few anyway. But uh, to me, watching that team crumble the way they did, and Mike Evans was completely again. Now this isn't the first time it's happened. Um, he was nowhere near on the same page as Brady. I mean, it took him a long time during that game before he actually was even close to being on page with them. Everybody, Brady was throwing balls in the dirt, errant balls, throwing them out of bounds, pressured constantly. Um, he threw the ball 66 times, if I'm not mistaken. He was 29 of 66 for 353 yards, two touchdowns and an interception. Now, on the flip side of that, Dak Prescott was 29 for 33 and 318 yards and four touchdowns. So that kind of, or maybe it was five, uh, four or five touchdowns. So <clears throat> when you look at it from that aspect, it, it yeah, Brady threw the ball a ton, but that's not really a good thing when you basically score 14 points and your guys are nowhere near on the same page as you. And they so, could not run the ball to save his life. No, that's been all year, though. They've yeah. been terrible all year with running. This so. game was a microcosm of their entire season. Everything, really that, everything that had gone wrong all season, 
once again showed its ugly head. And the Buccaneers are not a good team, and I think they're going to go back to being a bottom feeder in the NFL because Brady's not going to be there. And so who? it's not like they have a top draft choice to go and pick up a young, hot starting quarterback. Yeah. You know, they're probably going to end up going out and getting maybe like a Gardner Minshew or a Taylor Heineke uh, ends up maybe going there. Maybe even a Derek Carr. Maybe, maybe. Derek Carr. Yeah. Um, that roster is just aging. And in the NFL, it's almost like if you aren't getting younger, then you're – you're decreasing as a, as a team because well, you're getting older. Yeah. If you're not getting younger, <laughs> you're getting older. And generally uh, in, in the NFL, if you're getting older, you're getting worse. Um, it's, it's not a good roster and they're going to have to go through and because they tried to run it back a couple of different times by bringing back the same guys and it just didn't work. And yeah. I just, that roster is falling apart at the seams and I don't know what they do going forward. Um, they probably, I don't know, maybe they signed Jameis Winston. <laughs> 30 for 30. Um, yeah. Well, if we uh, if we really look at it, you got Mike Evans that's aging, and he's still playing well when he's not injured, but he's really can't not. Can't make the club from the tub. Cannot make the club from the tub. And I, I, I can't say that he won't get picked up by somebody else, but I don't think he'll be there next year. I don't know what his contract looks like. If he still has one after this year, I don't know. But I can't I, – I really can't understand why he would be there next year given – unless they come up with a quarterback that he really wants to play with. Um, the clock management management was kind of strange last night with the Bucks as well. Uh, but all, all in all, they played terrible. And honestly, their defense, it was supposed to be so great. They did not look good last night. So, getting to Brady now, he gave a press conference that basically looked like he was never going to be back in the Bucks building again. It, yeah. That was a weird. It was weird because, you know, he said that he, he gave his, like, goodbye speech in the middle of answering a question and then just left. So, that yeah. was what was weird about it. You know, I don't think anybody expected him to being back with the Buccaneers. I don't think that was ever the question. The question mm-hmm. is, is he going to be back at all? And if so, who does he play for? And then, you know, we've talked about this, and there's plenty of time in the off season to give our two cents about it. But Raiders, Jets, Miami, those sort of teams, and Even it was just a weird. In there, so. Yeah, it's just a, it's just a weird way to go, and. Um, you know the the off season of the quarterback carousel continues to run, and the one thing that I know is that uh, Brock Purdy will be in San Francisco, and he's not as good as everybody thinks. So, and you know what? It's similar to what I thought with Brady. I knew that if they got into the playoffs, it'd be a one and done, no matter who they played, and that's exactly what they were. I said it on previous shows. If they got in, they'd be a one and done, and they were. So, I didn't expect it to be that kind of an ass kicking, but uh, it was an ass kicking. Yeah, I mean that was just a slaughter. But uh, I don't know what he's going to do. I mean, honestly, if he was smart, he'd walk away. He's he's got a ten year bumped, ten year, three hundred and seventy five million dollar contract sitting and waiting for him. Why wouldn't he take that and go sit in the booth? I mean, I don't want to hear him talk, but people may. I don't know. I just don't want to hear him talk. Um, if he wants to hear his name, because he is a narcissist, and that's there's no doubt he's, he isn't, but if he wants to hear his name, then he needs to go and hear himself talk on the radio, on, on, during a game. Be an analyst. Get paid. Quit getting your ass handed to you and making each year you get progressively worse. And you don't know what you're going into with the next team that you have. Yeah. Uh, so it, 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 to me, it's just it's ludicrous that he's even considering coming back, especially after the year that he had with losing his family and losing everything else. And then to get his ass handed to him in a playoff game, I just – I don't know. Uh, he hasn't lost that bad since 2002 in a playoff game. So <clears throat> I, I just don't understand why he would want to come back. 
other than maybe he just doesn't feel like he has anything else, or he's worried about what may come out in the wash when he's finally gone and Belichick's finally gone and it's over with. Well, and it's, you know, you could, I could understand the argument that it's all, you know, it's like he lost his family to keep playing football and now he's just going to leave and then what? So it's like yeah. his football he has left and so you come back and you play another year. Yeah, I if he does, that's on him, but he just continually runs his legacy by doing this. Um, more than I think, in my opinion, is already kind of tarnished anyway. I think he's just making it worse. So he just needs to move on. And, and strangely enough, uh, Gronk was on the New Heights podcast, and he no spoilies. I haven't listened to it. It's really good. I but that's he, what my father told me. Yeah, and honestly, I mean, I will say this: it's not really a spoiler, but he did have some things to say about Brady, um, and how he felt when he was ready to walk away from the game. Um, I think Brady doesn't have look. His Gronk is not the smartest guy. I, I'm not being rude. He's just not. Um, but he was smart enough to know along with I think his mother's help and his brothers that you know four of the five played in the NFL but that it's just time to walk away and when you don't want to go into work the next day and you wake up and you go God I gotta go to work that's when you know it's time to walk away and that's kind of how he looked at it he just didn't have the drive or the determination for it anymore he had yep. a few things to say about Brady. I'm not going to get into it. I'll let you watch it, but um, I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I just think it's time for him to retire. I think it's just time for him to just walk away from the game. He's going to be 46 in August. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, the last guy that I knew that played into his mid 40s. Every time he stood up and I listened to it, he sounded like uh, a machine gun going off with all the bones cracking in his body. So, uh, I don't know why he would want to do that to himself or continue to take that downhill slope, but that's what he decides to do. That's on him. Uh, I think it's just kind of stupid in my opinion, but whatever. I mean, everybody has a reason for doing what they do. Uh, the games this weekend, really quick. What are you thinking on these games this weekend? Um, I think the divisional round is the best weekend of NFL football. Yeah, it is. Um, 49ers Cowboys. I think that one will be a good game. Um, I think that the Cowboys pass rush. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how Brock Purdy reacts to it. You know, I think that Brock Purdy is not the next coming of Jesus, and that he's not as good as everybody thinks he is. Um, I have some significant problems with some of the things that he does, and he has some really bad habits. There's that play that's going around on Twitter and it's been going around on Twitter where it's the beginning of the fourth quarter and it's that like 50 yard touchdown pass or almost a touchdown pass to Jawan Jennings. And it's a play action pass. Jennings is running down the sideline. It's blown coverage and he has wide receiver has four yards of separation. So, which is the most wide open pass you will see in the NFL and he still misses the throw. Instead of throwing it to his shoulder near the sideline and in front of him, he throws it, the ball. He underthrows it to the other shoulder. And if this will, if that pass was made in 2003, Jennings would have been it's just blown up. Yeah. Um, I Quandre Diggs just did not put a hit on him, and I'm kind of surprised because it's at that point where if you hit him at the catch point, then you know, you could get an incomplete pass. Um, at that point, the game hadn't been blown open yet. It was still close. So that it was just a bad pass all the way around. Um, there's a ton of things like that that he does. He has bad footwork. He has what I like to call happy feet, yeah. where he's always chopping. Yeah. He doesn't set his feet to throw. And, you know, there are some guys like Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen who don't have to have great footwork because they don't have to step into the throw they can throw it because down the field, just with their arm strength alone, Brock Purdy does not have that kind of arm strength. And so not only does he end up, you know, he'll underthrow guys, but with, while you're moving your feet constantly, you're just not as accurate. And there are a ton of times where he's overthrowing receivers. And because he has guys like George Kittle, 
uh, making catches, they will come down with the catch and, you know, it'll be fine. It'll come down as a completion despite the fact that the only reason that he caught the ball was because, you know, he's the second best tight end in the NFL. Uh, uh, third. I'm going to give it to Andrews. Okay, there you go. That's fair. <laughs> no, I'm good with that. Yeah. Um, I just think that it's it's really strange, and I don't know if you can explain this to <clears> me. <throat> it's really strange how when Jimmy Garoppolo was running that offense, we kept talking about how great Kyle Shanahan is and how Jimmy Garoppolo is a system quarterback. And all of a sudden, when Brock Purdy starts running that offense and is also winning games under that offense, the conversation turns into, look how great Brock Purdy is, and not, isn't this the same offense run with a similar kind of quarterback? Uh, the reason is, is because he was Mr. Irrelevant that was dead last in the in the seventh round and never expected to see a football field for any reason whatsoever. And he stepped in and he's won six games straight. And he did play fairly well for in those six games. But I will, you know, it's like Thiz and I were talking about uh, – off the air that in that system any quarterback can look pretty good so <clears throat> when you got a Christian McCaffrey you're going to look good when you've got guys like you know a Kittle you're going to look pretty good when you got a coach I mean, like Shanahan you're going to look pretty damn good and, and, a, and a system that runs the ball so well so when you run play action pass the dude was literally from when he he was two yards when he was about four yards away from the line of scrimmage, the corner, um, who is one of these rookie corners that came in, Tariq Woolen, who is also yeah. one of the best corners, you know, in, in the league. He's a top corner in the league. Sauce Gardner, Trent McDuffie, and Tariq Woolen. This may be the best corner rookie class, like, ever yeah. in NFL history. Yeah. Um, but that's a conversation for another day. You know, he when he was that far off, the line of scrimmage Tariq Wollen was selling out for the run and then when he when Jennings ran by him he was trying to catch back up but Jennings is just too fast I mean when he made it to when Jennings was at the first down marker he literally had four yards of separation and it's just it's just really weird how the narrative changes when you when you're just changing the quarterback and uh it's the same offensive system well, the same thing happened when, when Minshew came in, and everybody thought he was the second coming of Mahomes, and that didn't work out well for him, at, you know, towards the end, and he's another backup again. But it just, you know, when you got a kid that comes in that really had no clue and really, really never expected to see a football field, and he comes in and plays well, they're going to make a big deal out of it. Now, talking about blown coverages and wide open, Last night, CeeDee Lamb caught a pass that there wasn't a defender within 60 yards of him. I have never, in fact, I think that was probably the most wide open wide receiver and catch and touchdown I've ever seen in all the years that I've played football. That was insane. Wasn't that, that was on a fourth down, wasn't it? It was. And I also believe, is, and they also believe that that was a play action pass. Um, it was pretty. It was clean. just a. I mean, it was just a great play design, and yeah. I think that, you know, I think the conversations about pretty much no matter what happens in this next game, I think that anybody calling for McCarthy's job, I think, is crazy because he showed that he can be a quality coach. Well, he, you know, he was before, and I, you know, he was brought in to to take him to the Super Bowl. The one thing I will say about this game coming up. Purdy is not going to know how to handle the pass rush that Dallas has. Parsons is a psychopath, lunatic, great player. I mean, the guy is just amazing. He opens it up for everybody else on that defensive line. And I just, I don't think he's going to be able to handle that kind of pressure and how fast they are. So I, I have a weird feeling, unless. San Francisco brings it on every phase of the ball, and Dak has one of his off days, which he seems to have a lot of. Dallas may win this game. Which sucks because I like making fun of Cowboys fans. Yeah. Um, and it's really nice to say that the Cowboys haven't even been to a championship game, um, you know, since I was born. So Yeah, yeah, they haven't been to – they haven't 
been to a championship game. Since I think since 96. 95. 95? Yeah, it was Oof. the last year. And that was a Troy Aikman year, if I'm not mistaken. So his last, one of his last years. But, um, yeah, it, it, again, I mean, Dak can have a game like he had the week prior and just fall on it apart completely, or he can come out and play like he did last night. I don't know. But either way, it's going to be – that pass rush is really going to put Brock in a, in a position that I don't think he's going to be able to handle. Because he hasn't seen nothing like that yet. So uh, It would be crazy if we had a Cowboys-Eagles or a Cowboys-Giants NFC Championship game. Yeah, it would definitely be crazy. The I ratings kind of rooting for the Giants, but – the ratings on a Cowboys Giants NFC Championship game would be insane. Yeah, yeah. I I feel like I, I am for the NFC side. I am rooting for the Giants. I think Saquon Barkley deserves it. I think they put together a really good team, and you know people can say what they want about um, what's his name, the quarterback. I can't think of his name. Right Daniel now. Jones. Daniel Jones. He actually looked really good in that last game. He did. So uh, he's got his moments, and he just looks like he knows what he's doing. So we'll have to see uh, how that plays out. But I hope the Giants get to that that NFC Championship game. I, I kind of would hope to see them get to the Super Bowl. But I would like to see Jason Kelsey also get to the Super Bowl again. So um, it's going to be interesting. As far as the AFC games go, the one that I think is going to be the most interesting is going to be the Bills and the Bengals because, look, no matter what you want to say, Josh Allen is leading the league in turnovers and forced fumbles with 32. The guy is the second coming of Brett Favre. He really is. I mean, he – I don't know what happened. I don't know if it's – He can have his own damn way. He just – he's – He's just making every once in a while. He just like makes a dumb pass. I mean, it, it, I don't know what it is. I I can't because, you know, Stephon Diggs will be going down the sideline and he'll just make a perfect pass. I mean, it just right in the bread basket. And then on the next play, he'll just try and force something in there. And it's like, there's no need for that. I don't know. No. I don't know what he it has is. No pass rush. It's like he's just standing there by himself and he makes mistakes like that. I agree with you. I don't know. I don't understand why he. Well, Nick Wright said that basically, and I kind of agree with him that he is a very good quarterback, but he just can't get over. He can't get out of his own way. He can't get over the fact that he's good. He just keeps pushing himself to try and be better than Mahomes, and that's not going to happen. Mahomes doesn't have thirty-two interceptions. He's never had thirty-two interceptions in the season. In fact, I think his highest is 13. So, and this is a guy that just threw for 41 touchdowns and 5,250 yards. So, I don't know, man. Uh, It's going to be interesting because the only thing I can say about the the defense of Cincinnati is, is that they've got Eli Apple, and he's not good. I mean, he's just, he's the Steven Nelson of the Cincinnati Bengals. That's a very good comparison, except Steven Nelson was not as mouthy. Well, he's close, but he wasn't, you know, I mean, he was close, but he wasn't completely as mouthy. But um, I don't know. It's, it's just going to be interesting. I, I we're, honestly, in the back of my mind, I have a strange feeling that Cincinnati's going to win this game. And I think I Cincinnati like will win. Yeah, I, I feel like that because I think. You know, somebody said to me that they they said it on Twitter that they feel like the Bills are going to be basically handed the game to a degree because of the what went on with DeMar Hamlin. I don't believe that. I think that they're seeing ratings, and the ratings right now are the Chiefs have lost to the Bengals three times. So let's match them up in, a, in, a, in an AFC championship game if they're going that route, which I don't. I can't say they are or not, but. If if they were basically if they were going to base it off of ratings, that would be more of a ratings game than the Bills and the Chiefs. So that's just my opinion on it. I I, I don't and I look. I think Joe Burrow is a great quarterback. I think he has some. 
I think he has some self worth issues to a degree, similar to Josh Allen, that he wants to be the best that there is, and neither one of them have come close to Mahomes' numbers. So, regardless if you know one came out a year later or whatever the case is, or one got injured, it doesn't really matter at this point. It's what you do in the regular season that counts, and you know we have the postseason. Yeah, the regular season and postseason, for that matter. It's what counts. If you can get in there and you can you can really show your worth, that's a different story. If you squeak in past a team like the Raiders, like you did last year, then that's not really showing your worth. Um, I look at the Bills and I think, okay, I had an interesting guy, um, basically a troll, on Twitter that was really, you know, he said. Allen was the best quarterback, hands down, purest quarterback in the league. Um, then there was Joe Burrow, then maybe Mahomes. So, which I, I mean, nobody takes any, uh, puts any faith into that or even worries about it. But the whole point is, is that when, if you look at the numbers that Mahomes has put up without Tyree Kill, which that's, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, is that first it started out as it was, well, hell, if we had all those weapons. And then we lost Sammy Watkins. So then, oh, well, you still got McColl and you still got this guy, you still got that guy. Okay, that's great. Then we lose Tyreek. And I'm not saying by any means that what we have is scrubs, because they're not. But they're not a Tyreek Hill. Um, they're just not. They're not a perfect Sammy Watkins when he's on back in the, you know, during when he did play and he helped us win a Super Bowl. So this guy went on to say, well, now it's the Bills whole mantra is, well, if we had that system, if we had Andy Reid's system, okay, so it went from the weapons to Andy Reid. Which is it? Well, it's like those people that say that, you know, Patrick Mahomes has to win a real ring. Yeah. Like, and it's the same thing. People are going to try and justify, you know, hating on him. Um, I think that it's pretty clear. I know, obviously, you know, I've got my bias. Just take a glance at my background. Yeah. But uh, I think that Patrick Mahomes is the best quarterback in the NFL. I would probably say that Joe Burrow is the second. He is. Um, yeah. But I think that there is a there's a separation between, you know, Patrick Mahomes and the the rest of the NFL. I mean, he's on his second. He's he's going to win his second NFL MVP, yeah. right? Um, he's already thrown for over 5,000 yards twice. He has hosted four AFC championship games. He's won a Super Bowl MVP uh, and a exactly. Super Bowl with that. He's been yeah. to two Super Bowls. Yeah. And, back yeah, what he's yeah, it, what, he's been in the league one year longer than Burrow. Yeah, one year. So, one year. I mean, I just it, at a certain point, you're not going to you're not going to get everybody to say that you're just going to you know, run out of excuses. Bit. I mean, yeah. that's the whole thing. You, at some point, you run out of excuses. Yeah. So I, I, I think Burrow, and the reason I put him number two is because of what he's had to deal with with his offensive line. I mean, he has had, I mean, he got sacked 68 times last year. This year, I think he was at 48, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe a little more. But now they have three, their injuries to three of their positions. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, now we're, they're back to where they started. So if the one thing that's going to ruin the Bengals' season is going to be that offensive line. And if Vaughn Miller was playing uh, for the Bills, I would have the Bills win in this game yeah. 99 out of 100 times because yeah. that offensive line is just so beat up. But I, I don't know what they're going to be able to do. Um, if they do come, if the Bengals do end up coming to Kansas City with how this defensive line is playing, I, I think that, you know, it could be it could be pretty good now. Joe Burrow is frustratingly nimble in the pocket. He's so good of just somehow getting out of everything, getting out of the getting out of the defensive you know way, uh, the lineman's way. So you know. Well, it, I mean, I guess uh, he's. I think he's the highest sacked quarterback again this year. So we looked this up a few weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. So that's two weeks in a row that he's or two years in a row that he is the highest sacked quarterback in the league. So I, what I feel like is that if they can, which we did, we, we've got this year that we didn't have last year in an offense or defensive line, 
is the relentless pressure that they continue to run for four straight quarters. If they can do that, they won't blow another lead like they did the last three times they met. And even when they met this year, our defensive line wasn't completely gelled. And I don't think we had – did we have Carlos Dunlap then, or was he just not playing? I think uh, we had him, but he wasn't playing, if I'm not mistaken. Because I think he signed – yeah. When did he sign? Carlos Dunlap's been here all year. Yeah, that's right. So I was thinking about – he signed, what, two weeks into training camp? He signed literally the second day of training camp. Because I remember sending a tweet out. He just wasn't that I, I remember yeah. sending a tweet out that was something along the lines of the Chiefs, off, uh, the Chiefs front office saw this pass rush for one day and thought, man, we need some help. Yeah, definitely. And I got to tell you, even you know, with him, the times that he wasn't in the game, which I was waiting for him to get into the game, but um, he, he plays out of his shoes. The guy yeah. is just relentless. So, and, um, you know, the Chiefs lead the league in uh, batted balls. So, yeah. you know, it's it's something that it's a different team. And if it comes to that, which I genuinely think that that's, that's going to be the matchup that is going to going to happen, is I think that the, Bill, the Bengals are going to end up coming back here for AFC Championship game. And um, Chris Jones has got to get his got to get his first playoff sack. Yeah, I think, and that I think I will guarantee you he gets his his first playoff sack. I mean, it's crazy that somebody with such a high, like high praise career, doesn't have a sack in the playoffs. Not he didn't have single anybody one. to help him. I mean, that was a lot of it. Is that he had no help? I mean, not he, even in that Super Bowl run with how good Frank Clark was playing. I mean, it's just crazy to think that not a single one. You didn't yeah. like. Not a single one has fallen in your lap. It's just crazy to just think that that's what's that's that ha- not that, happened. That, yeah, it's it's sad that that's like a mantra of everybody's that you know. Well, he, he doesn't sack anybody in the playoffs. Well, I think this is the year I'm going to put it out there. I guarantee you, he has a sack in the playoffs, and and he may even have. I'll go as far as to say he has a strip sack. I hope I, so. I don't think he's going to let this go any longer. So. Uh, whether it be this week especially up. last year you know in the after the Bengals game you know he said that he just needed to make one play and he couldn't do it and it's I don't know it's just such a weird it's one of those weird um, sports stats that doesn't make any sense yeah I agree and I you know of course you're gonna put it on yourself no matter what and I I understand that but again you had Frank Clark and you had Chris Jones. You really didn't have any help. You had Ingram that really wasn't doing anything at that point. Um, he started off pretty good, but then he kind of fell off towards the end of the season. So now you've got Karlofkas that's come into his own. You've got Carlos Dunlap. you got Saunders with a rotation with Mike Dana. Then you also add Frank Clark in there. Oh, Lord. you got a, you got a group of guys that are serious about – sacks this year i think they ended up with 49 and a half on the season which is double what they had last year yeah the second in the nf second or third in in the nfl yeah so i would say that they're ready to um they're all ready to bring down burrow i know that that that's the one thing that i know that they're ready to do so if it ends up being the chiefs and cincinnati in the AFC championship game it might get ugly so uh, be prepared. The one thing I want to say about the Bills really quick, and I've thought this for a while now, and it's been brought up by not only myself but some some national analysts that are ex-players. Man, uh, Matt Milano's a dirty-ass player. No matter no, he... how you look at it, the dude's a dirty-ass player. He, I don't know, uh, he gets away with a lot of shit, too, and it's irritating. I mean, when he blasted that quarterback, uh, who was it that he blasted out? That kid for, was it Miami? Yeah. That's who they faced, yeah, Skylar yeah. Thompson. Skylar Thompson, I mean, he was obviously out of bounds. I mean, yeah, he, his foot wasn't out yet. There was no reason to hit him like he did. He had nowhere to go. He was basically heading out of bounds. 
and he blasted him into the wall, basically. So, and then he got up, and afterwards, people were bitching about it, and he said, oh, he was still in bounds. Who gives a shit? That's basically what he said, which I'm kind of surprised the refs didn't throw it on, you know, throw a flag on him, but they didn't. He's just a very dirty player. And when he hits somebody, as he's getting up, he twists their ankles. I've noticed that numerous times where he grabs an ankle and twists it, which to me I think is just – There's know. a couple of – we saw that a couple of times. I can't remember who it was, and I wish I did. Um, Depot Samuel, some – the I can't remember who it was. But a Seahawks player tackled Depot Samuel and twisted his ankle. Yeah, and, I know who he is. He's the same one that was real he, – he was played dirty against us as well. Um, and, well, and um, who uh, Tom Brady slid tackled somebody. I don't know if yeah. you saw that. Uh, yeah. He tripped somebody up on uh, the the interception. He went in and and did a slide tackle like he was playing yeah. soccer. Yeah. So there's yeah. there there's players out there that and we've talked about Mac Jones and the way he plays. So there's just a few guys in the NFL that that just don't don't play. You know, by the same. I mean, it's inherently a violent game, but there's certain ways to play, and uh, there are some guys that just don't play by the same rules. Well, you think the son of a bitch would actually, after watching what he watched during that game, maybe he would have changed the way he hits a little bit, but he just doesn't care. He's just a man. He's a violent son of a bitch. I mean, I don't know if he's got just anger issues or what, but. There was really no reason for that. There's no reason to twist somebody's ankle either, but he does it. So, um, but anyway, what's he said? What's Scott say? Cisco with the job. Oh yeah, Cisco. He's another one that's dirty as hell. Um, he's right. Oh yeah, the corner, the one yeah. that hit um, Juju. Yeah, he's a dirty bastard too. That'll be interesting if he comes when that comes back in the game, and we'll talk about the Chiefs game on Thursday. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I pre- Scott, again, you never sent me. You got to DM me your information, dude, if you want your gift. Because um, we're going on three weeks now. So if you're on Twitter, just go to Chiefs Focus, which I think you are, and DM me your address, your full name, address, and phone number, and, and uh, or ad- address with zip code. That's really all I need. And I will send your gift out to you, man. Um, with that being said, uh, we're going to try and do a giveaway this weekend. So, we're going to make up something between now and Thursday for the Chiefs to have to do to get this gift. But, um, we're going to try and do something. And we're going to try and do something for the AFC Championship game. So, and we'll really do something if they get to the Super Bowl. So, uh, Everybody that listens to this on on a recording or on the podcast version of it, make sure you tune in live because if you're not live, you're not getting a chance to get to the gift um, or to the giveaway. So make sure you tune in live. And with that being said, make sure you check out Foco Sports on all of our platforms. Click on it. Check out things you like. Um, All licensed gear from every team, every sport. And I think you'll like what you see. With that being said, appreciate you for coming on, Quentin. And yeah, no problem. As always. And we will talk to you guys again on Thursday. Peace out, everybody.